that. So welcome back to the OODA Loopers. Uh, this is session three. And as you'll see, if you've watched sessions one and two, the crowd has grown immensely. Um, so I was making some notes before we started recording. So we've got uh, Roger Venegas, who's a real scientist, unlike me, who's joined us. And he's been looking at uh, the various different things to do with the OODA loop and uh, modern scientific method. We've got Margot who's joining us, and I'm just going to remember because I wrote this down and now forgetting. So Margot's joining us from the Center of Naval Analysis. Uh, and so she's done some really, really cool stuff, which you might get to talk about in this conversation. We've got Kim and Andrew who are back from the previous sessions, along with Chris and Ben. And I'm sure we're going to explore some of Ben's uh, new slides that he's been putting out recently. <clears throat> and then we have a Miro board link, which I'll be able to record as part of this session as well. Um, then we have two amazing police officers joining us, Lou from Chicago, uh, who's a police detective and really uses these types of experiences in real life where any of the rest of us get to watch it on the news broadcasts. And then Ron, who's a captain in the Seattle Police Department, and both Lou and Ron were at the Quantico sort of, uh, I don't know what was called the Quantico sort of, uh, sort of uh, session that you all got involved in where uh, Brian Ponch, who's down there on my screen, uh, worked with you all and came up with the diagrams that eventually ended up in the book, which is where Andrew sort of said we should come and discuss this. So. Uh, everybody seems to have this deep interest in the OODA loop, and I wanted to bring people together for a few perspectives. In previous conversations, we've talked about spiral theory, about the OODA loop being a kinky slinky, apparently, and then these time, I'm sorry, Margot, these time spirals through, through space, yeah, uh, which really fascinated us. Um, Ponch reminded him, asked me to remind him about implicit versus explicit loops today, and I think that's one thing worth exploring because... If I talk to my uh, sort of uh, colleague, Professor John Turner from UNT, and we talk about implicit knowledge, implicit skills, they are individualistic. So when you look at the OODA loop with lots of Im word implicit around it, it tends to suggest it's a individual loop or individual process, not a team process. But Ponch will argue the latter on that one, I'm absolutely quite sure. And I'd be very interested to hear some inputs on this. And then there was the, the work that Ben's really been putting out on LinkedIn in the last week or two. And the slides have been some fant fantastic graphics and some fas fascinating materials that have been put out on there. I'm going to load up the, uh, the Miro link uh, that was sent out. And I'm going to move that to a different place. So in the chat, there is a, a link to a number of slides that... Uh, and I'm just going to hit that button there and then get rid of a couple of things here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record, I'm going to share this, but for, from the point of view, if you wanted to see it, you can load it independently. If I share this, it will record it and then uh, it'll record it in a separate window so that we can use that uh, for the benefit of the audience. So they all know what we're looking at because they'll have different videos. Um, what have I missed? There's a lot of information, of course, on the Miro board. What have I missed on what we've talked about in previous sessions? Ben, Chris, Andrew, anybody help me out here so we can get the conversation flowing? That's a heck of a lot to sum up from the last couple of hours. Um, I, I think we've probably just given the new audience um, Dive in waste quite a lot of time going over everything, wouldn't it? Yeah, so let's we can dive in a little bit. Um, so, Nigel, I have an idea here. So there's a, there's yeah. a nice connection with Ron and, and uh, Lou and, and Margo here I want to bring up and, and something that was discussed last night and it connects back to the implicit and explicit. So uh, just some history real fast. Uh, when we were working on the uh, accidents at sea, uh, when I was working with the SecNav team, understanding how to build high-performing teams and all that, uh, we reached out to Margo. We also reached out to uh, a company called Frontline Mind, who happens to be in the Cognitive Edge Network, and that's Dr. Ian Snape. Um, fantastic things going on at the individual level, and I, I was going to brief Margot on this next week, but I think I'll take the time to do it now. Uh, Lou brought up some performance things today from the field, high heart rates, high things like this. 
Um, Ian's book, Dr. Uh, Snape's book will be out soon, I think October. Um, it's about resilience. And the discussion we had last night was about how do we uh, build resilience? Uh, how, do we, how do we bring together biometric data? How do we bring together sense-making data? How do we do all these things? And it's all centered around an individual OODA loop. And one of the key things he brought up last night was implicit learning and explicit learning. We learn better from implicit learning, right? And I, we can check in with um, uh, Roger here soon to, to verify and Margaret to verify that as well. But the idea here is we need that ambiguity in the field when we're working on things. We need that, um, uh, what they call in sports, uh, the constraints led approach. You put people in situations that they're going to see in the future uh, and we, we help them reduce their heart rate. So when they do experience that, um, they, they, they've seen it before. So it's a lot of lessons we learned in the military. But I think this is a great direction to go with today, uh, considering the folks that are in here with Roger, with Margo, with, with Lou, with Ron, um, at the individual level, uh, maybe this is where we want to go with this type of teaming. And Margo, uh, I definitely want to reach out to you in the next couple of weeks to kind of share with you where we're going with this and I, what, what I think is in the realm of possible. And Ron and Lou, I think this is right in your field. So uh, um, what do you guys think about that? You guys want to go in that area today? I think you've got something with that implicit, explicit stuff. So maybe let's try and get a, a, an understanding of we all agree on what that means because explicit learning is when you know, when you learn from other people who are expressing it or when something becomes when you express something it becomes explicit because other people hear hear it and learn from it when it's implicit you're putting your own life's experiences all the things you've learned the way you see the world the way you process what's happening and in my understanding as purely my understanding if you're going through the sort of OODA loop sort of thinking process you're visualizing all the possible outcomes when you're doing that sort of orientation stage and you're using all that implicit knowledge and your view on the world and your way to connect the dots to make a decision. And so I'm fascinated on how this becomes more than an individual thing. So maybe that's some of the conversation could be thrown in there as well. Roger. Could it be safe to say that implicit learning is incidental learning, is learning that you kind of stumbled upon because it's not something that you avidly seek. So implicit learning is like sometimes you're doing something and then you, oh, I've just learned something and you weren't aware of learning it. You implicitly learned it from that scenario. Would that be it? Yeah, I think it depends if we're just if we're distinguishing uh, implicit and explicit learning the process of gaining information versus implicit and explicit knowledge right so uh, implicit knowledge is riding a bike, you, I can't explain to you how I ride a bike, I just know how to do it. Um, but I made a deliberate effort to learn how to do that, right? And so, so I guess that's probably something that we should identify up front is, is whether the knowledge and the learning, whether we mean the same thing by that or whether ma we're making a distinction between the two. And that's a really good distinction to make because knowledge that you implicitly know is something you've already experienced. And when you implicitly learn something, it's an environment that you didn't know that you're actually learning it until you've actually completed the action, correct? Can we agree with that? Um, no, it's not that I'm just, I, I'm having to Google these things because I'm just looking what, the, so implicit learning is acquisition of knowledge about the underlying structure of a complex stimulus environment by a process which takes place naturally, simply, and without conscious operations. So that's basically what I think we just said. Um, let me, let me well, give you some more context in the, in the conversation last night. And, and this is, and I agree with everything that's being said. So we were talking about pararescuers, uh, our PJs in the uh, Air Force, and uh, all of them have the strength to climb to do 20 pull-ups with a 50-pound bag on their, or backpack on. But you put them in, a, in an environment where they have to climb a ladder, which they're all physically capable to do, uh, climb a ladder to a helicopter. Some of them can't do it. Half of them can't do it. And why is that? Their heart rate goes up. And this, this connects back to what Ron and, and, and Lou uh, experienced in their world. So how, how do you how do you coach them? How do you do things? Um, how do you improve that performance? And how do you measure performance in, in that type of environment? So the, I, that's kind of where this whole ca this idea came from is you have to put people in the environment they're in or, or a similar environment. You know, we, we always talk about anthro simulation and um, 
experiential learning activities to, to help people learn. Uh, but we have to create the conditions where people don't know they're going to be learning something. And, and Lou and, and Ron, um, I kind of want to bounce this off of you guys because you have to train people in the field and then you have to, or you have to train them in an activity and then take them into the field. Um, so thoughts on that, Lou or Ron? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, implicit, uh, the implicit stuff is, is just one of the big, big things that they're looking at in, poli in police right now, implicit bias being one. And um, uh, I, I've kind of started looking at, at the OODA loop as a place to examine that and maybe do some retraining or reworking uh, with uh, Peter Scharf down at uh, LSU. Um, so I think you've hit the nail exactly on the head, uh, Ponch, that the, the, this, the implicit side of things is, is, is really critical and, and training is really critical. This immersive kind of uh, real life, real time uh, kind of training, not just training an individual skill or a set of individual skills and then expecting somebody to go out in the field and put all that stuff together on their own, but being able to coach them through it, train them on the skills and then, and then put them in scenarios where they have to start picking and choosing and using those skills. Uh, and um, that makes them better. It helps build their creativity when they actually get out in the, in the real world and they have to, they're faced with a novel, a novel scenario or a novel scene. They can grab stuff that they've used before or that they've seen other people use in those trainings, those real life kind of trainings. I think Lou was talking about Shoot House today, which is you know, uh, very much uh, that kind of a training. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely the direction we need to go uh, as far as policing goes. And certainly something I think where there's a lot of utility in other environments as well. I'm right. just looking. I'm sorry, go ahead, Lou. Yeah, so when I think of the uh, the implicit explicit dichotomy here is the for me, it's the explicit is a follow a flow chart. It's very describable. It's uh, it's much more analytical, right? It, it, it's what we see when we come up with learning objectives and like this is what you will be able to leave with. Whereas the implicit is like, hey, we're going to do stuff. We're going to experiment. I don't know what's going to stick, though. I don't know what it is that's going to like reform into like a, a new mental model. Um, so before the recording, I talked about that this morning I was at this live fire shoot house. It's basically simulations of a variety of, of policing um, scenarios from burglar alarms to domestic violence to active shooter to hostage rescue to search warrant service. And they all drive a certain response from teams of officers. And I witnessed 20 year plus officers. And like, I got on the job a couple of months ago, officers go through this. And some of the young officers were just not able to keep up, right? The pace of change in their environment was just exceeding what they were capable of comprehending and making sense of, right? And I could see it in their eyes, right? And then you got the experienced officers that are moving through it, not breaking a sweat. Their heart rate didn't change at all, right? And we need to turn, we need to artificially inflate the experiences for those young officers so they can accelerate through to become more experienced, right? Through through the simulation. Now, one of the uh, in many of the debriefing sessions that we ran today, uh, the older officers that I've worked with personally would say yeah, I saw Lou do this, or I read his body language or the way that he was standing, the way that he was looking. And they picked up on that stuff, right? The nuance, that's implicit stuff, right? Whereas the young kid has no idea why I'm standing slightly to my right, canted this way and with my head in this direction. He doesn't understand that I'm communicating something with him. And it was very difficult for me to describe why it is that I stand where I stand, point where I point, like, like just my, my body language, posture, facial expressions, all those things that experienced guys picked up on, the young kids were not. That to me is the difference between explicit and implicit. Implicit is the stuff that you gain through experience and exposure over time and duration. And it, it builds a chemistry that, that, that is really hard to replicate without experience, exposure, and duration. 
So Chris, you had a good comment you put in the chat that if you want to say that out loud, I mean, I can read it as easily as you, but it's your comment. So I know that was a good, good comment. Yeah, no, no, it was just a, a query of, you know, so for, for me, it sounds like, and obviously I'm not in this situation, but it sounds like everyone's getting the same level of input in these things. You know, the, the, the data is there to be sensed, but it, it kind of sounds like the experienced officers are able to filter what they need to pay attention to and how they need to pay attention to it rather than just getting overwhelmed with the input because they have that experience of the kind of more interpretative elements as well. I could be totally wrong. I, 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 no, I think you're right. I think that, the, it, and it, it's not just filter, but um, they can accurately determine of all that information coming in at, at, at the particular moment, what's what's important for them to pay attention to and what isn't. That doesn't say that they're excluding it like a tunnel vision kind of a, a thing, uh, because something else may occur in the environment there that they pick up on and will shift their shift their attention or shift their uh, approach to the situation. But but I think that they're a, they're a lot more accurate about what uh, what things are really important to look at and what things are. Uh, something they can put aside for the moment. So they know that looking at Lou is important, for example, and reading the body language is important where, you know, the you know they're probably don't. not even consciously thinking about the body language a lot, Bingo. but Bingo. Uh, when something, uh, you know, they'll react or respond to what the other folks in the team, and that's where it's really critical to do the, the way that you do the training so that uh, because so many times, we're not sending the same team of people in, right? It's whoever shows up on the call is now your team. So you're forming these teams on the fly and folks have to have that shared kind of understanding, that shared knowledge and be able to work within each other. They may have never worked with each other before, but if they understand the fundamentals of what we're doing and can pick up on, on what's going on, the nuance that you're talking about, um, they can be very success, successful or are, are frequently very successful in what they do. Um, Roger, so, you had a you wanted to make a point on this because this is really getting into shared mental models and shared cognitions as far as you know we're starting to get into that. But Roger, to expand on all this, everybody's on. I think we're all on the same page. But um, from a scientific perspective, we have this system in our body. It's called the reticular activating system. This reticular activating system takes all of the observations except for smell. Smell is the only um, sense that is um, emotionally connected. So when we experience fear, we experience a new observation. When we go into new situations with new teams, our heightened sense of fear expands our reticular activating system to be hypersensitive. So experienced personnel are more apt to pick up subtle changes and also have extrasensory perception of subtle um, gestures, motions, because 75% of most of our communication is in body language. So if we look at our environment today, we have masks on, we look at facial expression for um, perception of happiness, anger, sadness, health, despair. So now our, our reticular activating system is overcompensating to look at the eye only for these kind of markers. So when we're in new environments, we're, exper we're expanding our paradigms and also finding those match mismatches to either lead us down that muscle memory that we already know how to conform to these kind of environments. Even if you have a new person on a very well-seasoned team, they're only as strong as that weakest person. So we really need to understand that the orientation and the incoming observations really affect how you're gonna execute those decisions. I mean, there's so much starting to make, start to pull together thoughts in my head. And I'm watching the chats. I mean, nobody else can see it. I mean, you guys can, but the audience won't be able to see this because there's so much fantastic stuff going in the chat. And I want to pull that out because a lot of what you were just saying and what Ron and Lou was just saying is really the crux of what Boyd was trying to sort of explain with the OODA loop. And this is where we want to sort of pull this up. And we get into things later, you know, sense making, weak signal detection, all these sort of things that we want from the complexity world, but it's sort of being leveraged by everything we're describing here. And I'm seeing comments that Chris and, uh, and Ben are sort of batting backwards and forwards about 
uncut up oh, my thing scrolling unconscious conscious <clears throat> pns cns somebody will tell me what that is in a minute sense observed stuff they were discussing uh and then ben you're talking about yeah also uh, chunking vertical versus horizontal complexity and then Chris, you're jumping back to crews versus teams. So we've got crew concept coming in there. Uh, and then before I go any further, because there's a whole bunch of new stuff from Margo as well. What's your thoughts? Because uh, I just want to try and pull some of those thoughts out that you you and uh, that Chris and Ben were sort of batting and back in the chat there and see how it relates to some of this conversation. Can, can, I, can I go with... Um, uh, who is that? After is that you, you, Chris? After you. All right. Can I can I go with the horizontal versus vertical complexity? So this is um, this is a concept. I think I mentioned this in the last in the last session. Um, so I'm paraphrasing massively, but vertical complexity is a, um, a a way of measuring sort of human development, right? To to what degree is the thing that you're you're doing taxing your your cognitive system, right? So from, from Lou's example, um, the, the, the people that are more experienced chunk up much more of the context of the situation from Lou's behavior. So they, they have the experience, they have this kind of extra fidelity of their senses that, you know, a half inch of, of Lou's head means something to them that it doesn't mean to somebody who, who isn't in this situation. I, and I have a similar kind of um, you know, I've served in the military, but my experience of this comes from actually working on the door. I used to work, um, used to work on the door in a pretty rough pub uh, uh, in a town in the UK. And I used to work with my brother and my best friend. And we had this, I mean, extrasensory perception is something that's come up a few times in the chat. And, and that's what it felt like, right? It, we would be walking through this pub with probably 200 people in it. One of, you know, one of them would be up on the balcony. The other one would be over there. I'd be walking through the crowd and literally... A, a half inch raise of the eyebrow would be a, would be enough to say that dude over there is going to be going out the door in in you know figures few so that to me is like that's the vertical complexity right that's that's familiarity with your situation such that you have these abstractions that you've built in that you can just you can just unpack a whole load of extra meaning from a very small initial seed because everyone has the context and then the horizontal complexity is the, the kind of the drilling, the, you know, complicated or clear domain where, you know, it's almost like tying your shoelaces. It's a sequence that you go through, but the better you get at that, there's always going to be a limit, right? There's no, there's no way you can chunk up the time bound sequences of the, the actions that you need to take, right? You get better at it and, and it moves into muscle memory, but you'll never you'll never get that kind of compression that Lou was talking about where a you know, quarter inch move of the head in a certain situation conveys meaning that you know, people get or they don't get based on their experience. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Chris, because there's, there's a couple of things coming out here. I mean, uh, Andrew was mentioning about we need to be aware of the bias that we get with experiences with that extra, extra, extra sensory perception. Um, and, and is that a danger? Because, I mean, in the chat, we're talking about retrospective coherence, which comes up quite a bit in, in a lot of posts nowadays. It's becoming more popular. Um, and is there a danger that uh, our implicit behaviour is being biased by things that we think we know, but we don't actually know? I don't know if I'm phrasing that in the correct way. I don't know if you've got some thoughts on that. Maybe things that we've justified after the fact is probably a, another way to put it, because, of course, when you're moving through a scenario that by nature is complex, you um, you're you're sounding it out as you go, you're probing as you go. But after the fact, you usually have the, the kind of utopian or dystopian justification for why it happened. And if everything worked out well and if somebody broke out and had a fight and you got them and whatever, it's because you're a genius and, a you know, amazing fighter and whatever. And if you missed it it's because well you know what could I do other people got in the way and there, there's always this kind of it, it, all humans do it I do it on a fairly consistent basis you look back at what you've done and you you kind of retrospectively try and apply coherence where at the time it was emergent there, there wasn't a specific type of coherence so um, I find that's that's interesting and it ties 
it ties a lot in what what Ben was saying, I think, and, and what you know um, Lou and Ron and, and Margot were saying as well. It, it all ties. Ben and I were talking about, um, and I, I put popped it in the mirror, and it, it's a much better version than the completely wrong one that I put in when I was super tired um, of the. Um, I, I called it Suda, which is a bit of a bastardization, I guess, if you want to look at it like that. But Ben and I were talking about the idea behind um, the fact that. You know, so you've got you've got observation, which kind of there's an interpretative element, I think, to observation where the sense of seeing isn't necessarily interpreted. It, it, it's a kind of a relay of information. And so for me, there's a there's a, a, a definition between sensing and observing, if, if that makes sense. Seeing is a sense, but observing tends to, for me, have some kind of interpretation. So I've, I've added a line in there and please, I'm sure everyone's gonna jump on me and say it's awful and wrong and whatever. So it was just <laughs> something I was playing with. And, and the reason I said PNS and, and CNS is because you're looking at your peripheral nervous system versus your, um, you know, your central nervous system where you make informed or supposedly make informed decisions. And the example that Ben and I were talking about was a hot potato. If you pick up a hot potato, the signals for that don't even get to your brain before your spine has said, drop that damn thing, it's hot, right? So you've gone straight from sensing, not observing, to action, which is reflexive, and that's peripheral <laughs> nervous system. And then it feeds straight back to an observation of, I'm holding something hot, I better put my, you know, and that's where you orient, where's the cold tap? Decide to put your hand under it, and then you start. So that was an interesting thought because there's a, a split between the conscious and unconscious perhaps, which is important. So I want to jump on that, Chris, because I started some lively debates online with people I could never convince um, for reasons we won't bother going into that, you know, is the UDA loop an open system? And I got into this whole, I got all these lectures about, no, it's a closed system because it's the way it's drawn and blah, 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 and all the rest of it. And people were throwing science papers at me and all the rest of it. And that's just before I went and made a big speech the other day at Catacon talking about why PDCA is not a closed system. It's an open system because you can start at any point and you can enter and exit at any point now the fact that Boyd drew it as a loop not not as a circle but as a loop uh, uh, originally people are now fixated on the fact that the entry and exit points are fixed and the process is fixed which is a closed system what you just described was definitely not a closed system and that's part of what and, and what and I want to get the drawing up the the diagram you were mentioning a minute ago I'll find it and put it on screen but that to me is one of the critical parts because everybody says, oh, you start with observe, then you are in, you decide and you act, you act. And, but you just said, you know, you, you sensed and you acted. There was not, <laughs> there was a big chunk that didn't exist there because otherwise by the time you'd figured that out, you'd have got burns on your fingers. So I want to throw that in. I don't know if that's a topic for people want to pull on, but that's something I want to throw in because this whole, is it an open system or a closed debate is going to go on and and Boyd didn't say it was an open system, but he said he was striving. I think there was I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. There were words that suggested that. And I know Roger's been reading the literature in depth with Charlie because Charlie's got a copy of every piece of paper that Boyd ever wrote, read or annotated. And he's been going through it religiously. I know with Roger over the last year. So I'm just going to throw that back out there while I try and catch up in the chat. And if you can tell me what the image was, Chris, I'll go and find it on Miro and put it on the screen because there's a bunch of images. It's buried, there. it's buried in the middle of all of Ben's far more excellent graphics. Which oh, is I, it that I one with like, love mo uh, like it says reality on it? Is it that one? It, that that is that's the one. Yeah, and and you can see I've I've kind of popped Kenevan in there, mostly in Orient, and it kind of tips into decide and tips into kind of observe and maybe sense. But, but if I blow this up a bit on my screen, so it's this diagram I'm sharing now, is that right? And again, it's, it's just an exploration, but it made sense to me because there are elements of, of action which cut out orientation, you know, and so on completely. And so I, I guess that part of what, you know, Lou was talking about with the live fire thing is you're, you're trying to head off it could, because you have the ability, of course, and Ben pointed this out, you have the ability to override that reflexive kind of element, that sense element you sense, and you know the triggers for it. So you can actually hold on to that potato, even though it's burning you and say, I'm going to hold this, whatever the cost, and override that, that kind of reflexive element. So that there is that element to it as well. So I haven't worked out where it might go, but there might be a, 
a wavy split of conscious and unconscious. Might be cat amongst the pigeons, might be total rubbish, but I thought it was an interesting exploration. So I'll let all of you tear it apart. Well, it's on screen and it's being recorded on screen for others to see. So thoughts, comments on what we've just been discussing? Yeah, my, hey, my initial reaction is you're not going through one loop. You're, you're going through this many times. So if you describe that hot potato again, you didn't just go through one. You went through multiple. You, you made a conscious decision somewhere. Exactly. Older. So you don't need to add exactly. on to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that silenced everybody because that was one of the conversations that had come in, come in the past that we're going through multiple mm -hmm. loops. And I know that we wanted to get Kinky Slinky back because that was in the chat earlier, but that was the sort of these continuous spirals over time. And and one of the things we... Oh, he's, <laughs> Lou's got the, he's got a plastic slinky. I should get <laughs> my metal one out. But so the whole point is, is that as you go through these loops... You, the entry and exit points may be changing and that and actually the way you exit your thinking in the previous loop may actually be dictate the entry point of the next loop which is what i've been trying to describe with pdca thinking depending how you form your hypothesis and the way you respond to that yeah and Nigel, see the, one, of the, one of the one of the drivers I'll behind one of the drivers and change in the way we look at the OODA loop in different contexts is the dynamics of the connecting framework, right? We're never in one context. We're moving around constantly. So it's, it's not a static thing. It's, it's we're moving through many, many, many loops throughout the day, um, maybe even, even in parallel. So that's what was the, the, what drove us to create the static view of the OODA loop in each domain. It doesn't mean that's the loop we do all the time. It's just the emphasis of it, right? So Kim, you were saying something about complexity being both subjective and objective. And I know it's really early in the morning in Oz, so I wanted to, to, to wake you up and invite you to sort of dig into that a little bit based upon some of what you've heard because your knowledge of complexity is greater than mine. Yeah, I was thinking about um, the deliberate practice element. So uh, one of the things about a complex space is Complexity is both a subjective and an objective thing. So something can be can appear complex to me, even though people have solved it around the world. Um, and I can do deliberate practice and learn the patterns and learn how to deal with it. And for my own subjective view of that thing, I can get better at it and move it into the complicated or the clear domain on the Kinevan framework. Uh, and then, in fact, if I was, you know, practicing to respond to uh, emergency events, a chaotic event, for example, uh, then I'm able to respond better when those events occur. But a truly objective, complex space. So, in other words, not it's not that I, in, it's only me that interpret it as complex. Um, you know, if I do that deliberate practice in that complex space, thinking that it's going to make um, give me a predictable result and it's truly a complex thing, what will happen is every time I do that thing, I'm going to get a different result because that's one of the definitions of complexity. So uh, I think we have to be quite careful when we look at something and say, I think I can you know, deliberately practice my way out of this and make sense of it. Um, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't, depending on whether it's a subjective um, complex space or an objective complex space. That, that's where I was going with that one. So I'm just scribbling notes here when I'm looking at the chat and listening to you, Kim, because Ben made a comment saying, based on some of the stuff I'd said, is that, well, I think so anyway, some of the loops don't have a start and, an, uh, and some don't have an end, which is interesting because that's, is that not a definition of an infinite loop? I don't know. Uh, Lou was sort of saying that he's not sure he totally agrees with that. Um, and, and Chris throwing about, you know, why he fed back the reflective reflexive back into observe which is hopefully on the diagram that's that's been shared at the moment and then andrew you threw in there and talked about the loop being even tighter or being a tight loop um i don't know lou can i pull you there and, and sort of you 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 were sort of questioning the idea that some of the loops don't have uh, an entry or an exit point which is an interesting concept yeah, I mean, I think there's one entry, right? For me, it was in uh, 1976, right? And then I think there's going to be an exit, and that's like uh, whenever I pass on to whatever world awaits me. Uh, and I mean, it just, it goes, right? And um, 
when a bee is uh, buzzing around my head when I'm sleeping, I'm still, you know, waving at it reflexively. I'm just operating in implicit guidance and control pathways. But it's like, I, I just, I never really connected with the idea of where's the loop and starting and stopping. For me, it, it, it's, it's literally always on. So there's somebody wants to pick up this. I'm just reading some words in here and, and I'm feeling like the times when I spend with Dave Snowden on my sofa and he's talking to me and I get my phone and literally sort of discreetly Googling what he's saying to me. And I do really mean that for truth uh, because now Roger said something about the, now if I pronounce this badly, Roger, just, just smile, you know, discreetly, but Einstein lung effect of objective and subjective approaches Chris then threw an infinite slink is attached at the ends per chance. Um, so I don't know who wants to sort of make some sense of that. Roger, what did you mean by that phrase, by the way, so just to help I, I, everybody? I've been reading this book. It's called uh, Mind for Numbers uh, by Dr. Barbara Oakley. And she talks about the Einstein effect. So imagine you're in a car and you see a car that you really like. So you, say you like a Ferrari. Then all of a sudden you start noticing all of the Ferraris and not the other cars. But you're not subjectively or objectively noticing them. You're just noticing them because you like the car and then you start focusing on just that car. Then it becomes very subjective, right? Because then you're like, oh, I really like this car. And then you start great gaining more subjectivity and weight. And then you start losing a little objectivity or vice versa. When you objectively don't like something, just because you don't know why you don't like it, you're gonna objectively reinforce that I don't like this because I don't know. You don't like a movie because of the title, you've never seen it, you don't understand it, you just don't like it. Then you objectively have no subject matter expert in that movie, but you just don't like it because of the way it looks. Or you don't so, like an actor, you don't like a comedian. That is what we call the Einstein effect. And then you start kind of forming some kind of one-sidedness, you become cyclops in that, in that advent. So as we traverse complexity, we need to avoid this effect in both subjectivity and objectivity. And we need to have a diffuse mind because when we have a hyper-focused mind, we don't let the ideas hit all parts of our brain. It only hits the areas that we know about. So when we have a diffuse brain, we hit all of the areas. And so that's what they say, take a walk when you can't figure a problem out, take a, take a short 10 minute walk, you come back and you can solve the problem most of the time. So we need to avoid that Einstein effect. Isn't the, the car thing, the, the what's also known as confirmation bias, you know, that you've decided you want to buy a red car, so suddenly all you see is red cars or, or that type of thing. I, I thought, and then, uh, Margot, you said something about the Bader-Meinhof effect. Yeah, it's um, colloquially called Bader-Meinhof. Okay, Bader-Meinhof. What is that just for the benefit of people like it's, me? It's the same thing. Once you hear something or learn about it, you feel like you see it everywhere. Uh, it's it's actually only tangentially related to to the terrorist group. <laughs> okay. How, oops. How close is that to the Dunning Kruger sort of uh, syndrome, which is you know, I, I've sort of learned about this, therefore I am now an expert at this thing. Is it is it is there a correlation or a, a relationship there? Uh, only that there are two German sounding names with hyphens in between them. <laughs> More inattentional blindness, probably. I think. <laughs> yes. Wow. Wow. So, uh, Lou, you talked earlier as well, and I'm only just mentioning this because I don't want to miss the point about the impact of time and stress within the OODA loop. And that's really an important thing because, like the hot potato, if you pick up something that's absolutely scalding hot, there is suddenly an element of stress there and there's definitely a time element there. Uh, this isn't like a long decision making process going through several different hypo hypotheses to decide what I should do. Um, I'm not sure if that was that was the type of thing you were talking about, about the so if you, um, you want to come back and just give us a bit of a, a thought on that, because you, uh, you and Ron obviously work in highly stressful environments day to day. I think uh, I think the missing piece to this conversation is discretionary time right and and like this is not static decision right and and that's kind of the the shortcoming that even some of Pancha's pathways in uh in the in the Kenevan Uda mock-up 
just can't capture because it's in print, right? Is that you can't see the movement, right? And the movement and, and it traversing through, right? So you're stuck with just like color codes. You gotta talk about in, in terms of time. Here's where this started for me is, uh, I'm in a video conference call with Patrick Van Horn, who's one of the authors of Left of Bang. He was one of the Marine uh, captains who worked with General Mattis on the uh, Combat Hunter Combat Profiler program. And a lot of it is based in sense making, complexity, uh, recognition prime decision making. I mean, all, all sorts of, of everything we're talking about, basically. I said, you know, I said, food is kind of like a corkscrew, right? And like the, the top of the cork on a wine bottle, right? Is like where you are in the moment, right? And then you just keeps on screwing through time, right? And we have a conversation about that and determine, you know what, it's more to it than that because it's a fixed twist rate on a, on a corkscrew, right? And that's not really what I wanna, how I wanna portray how our brains work, right? Because some brains work faster in certain conditions than others, right? In ones that I'm experienced in, my brain works fast. In ones that I'm not familiar with, my brain works slow, uh, which is the whole, which is the whole, uh, where the whole slinky thing came up with, right? And that like, this is the axis of some element of fixed time, right? Uh, you cannot adjust time, right? One second, uh, this is an hour, a millennium, it, it doesn't matter, right? But this is a fixed unit of time, right? And things change as you move along this time, right? At a, at a certain rate. And yes, there's things that we could do that impact the rate of change, but there's only so much that we can do of our ability to make sense of it, to um, ponder different options, uh, hypotheses, create different uh, different models, right? Before we have to do something. And that's where the slinky model comes in is because now we're compressing this. It's more about rate of change, right? It, it's the rate of change of you being able to uh, understand but the rate of change of, of your environment. So your environment might be, include uh, business competition, uh, competing uh, aerial adversaries, right, in, in Boyd's world. But this is really about changing your ability to respond to it. And, right, this, this would be an extremely fast rate of change of the environment because there's lots of changes happening per unit of time, right? This is you sitting on the beach, okay? Ain't nothing changing out there, okay? Uh, things are as relaxed as could be. And what we wanna do is figure out how we can get our people to make faster comprehension faster sense making, uh, better hypotheses, better, faster probing to push out into, uh, into action, right? In, into, inter, in, into basically interplaying with our environment. So if the environment's moving this fast, but you're only able to process it at this fast, it's outpacing you. Right? Likewise, if your environment is very stable, right? It, it, it's not changing, but your brain is capable of processing this, uh, you're bordering on boredom. Like you're, you're thinking too fast, right? That's, that's, how, that's how I see the, the power of the, of the slinky analogy is talking about time, right? And then what is it that we can do to make more turns in the same time? Right? How can we open up bandwidth to be able to process more, to accept and consume what that, what that changes in the environment? Um, and I'll say this, that one of those things is by becoming so experienced and doing something over and over and over again so much that you're able to push certain things that were eaten up bandwidth into the subconscious. And because the subconscious does not eat up my bandwidth. It, it, it's operating on like a the, the system one. And Chris, you just I'm watching what you're writing in the chat, and I've got the 3D model as well. I'll pull that up if it's valuable to show uh, on the video. But 
you're mentioning back in session one, and I think you're absolutely right. We started to talk about multiple helices or helixes, if you prefer. Uh, and we talked about that, you, you know, which you can context switch between, which can dictate the speed. But there's a lot in what Lou's saying starting to resonate with me because we talked about this whole time concept because we always think about the OODA loop when we first read the stuff of Boyd and we think of fighter pilots and the punches of this world, you know, making split second or millisecond decisions to, to save life and limb and to, to maneuver in, in, at high speeds. So you always think of this OODA loop as this very, very fast thing. And what Lou's saying, we need to be able to process much more in the same unit of time. But at the same time, that, that sort of level of processing changes depending on our context uh, go on, Chris, you were going to add something there. I could see you were waving. Well, no, I, I was just thinking. So so if Lou had multiple slinkies and some of them were more compressed and some of them were more stretched out, as the context of your environment changes or, or your, your need to react to the environment changes, would that be rather than compressing or, or you know, dilating the, 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 the OODA loop itself, if you like, if you want to look at it like that, would you not context switch to a a faster flow like uh, just just it was just seeing you know what Lou was doing there with the because of course you know and I, I put in a tongue-in-cheek comment obviously we're not talking about time dilation and you know near light speeds and stuff where the perception of time does change and all that kind of thing but but you know being able to switch to your loop might not be going um as fast as as someone else is based on sitting on a beach but if if something happens on a beach and you know, there's a disturbance and somebody runs out with a knife and you happen to be, uh, you know, a, a, an off-duty officer or whatever it is, <laughs> taking your time out. Would you change that loop or would you switch almost immediately to one that you've been in train to deal with that situation? Would that be a different loop that you have? I, it just is just a, a, an interesting thought based on what we were talking about in session one. I think this is about capacity to accept that rate of change. Right. So, so it's in the context, how much can I understand of it? Right. Like I have a mind or, or, a, or like an eye for like the pickpocket when I'm on vacation. Right. And like I interrupted my own pickpocketing in Europe. Right. Because I see that kind of that's just human behavior. Right. But there was probably so much other crap going on around me that I'm totally oblivious to. Right. But I can consume a lot of information about scammers and pickpockets you know so it's so like there's a capacity for it so i still hold that capacity when i'm sitting on the beach but now i'm i'm really activating it when i'm in a, a european train terminal but you switch it for when you need it but you don't have to switch it and stay there you can switch of you know use it and then switch back to where you were so you know ben. some degree to some Sorry, degree, we're talking about we do we do experience uh, time, uh, say dilation or contraction. Uh, you know, I, I over the years have sat on a number of shooting review boards, and and then also just per, my personal experiences out in the uh, out in the street, um, and it mirrors experiences of of high performance athletes who, you know, when they are really in the zone, they can. You know they'll describe a time time uh, uh, distortions a lot of times expansion of time, but they feel like they've got, you know, they're they're maybe working really hard, but but time is just kind of going in slow motion, and they're able to make the adjustments that they need to make to do whatever they do. Um, and we, I hear that a lot about the uh, from folks in the shooting review boards, and you know it's that particular activating system where they're, it, it's stimulated to such a degree where they're able to actually do things that you can't, shouldn't physically be able to do or mentally be able to do. See rounds coming out of a handgun. Um, uh, you'll hear, uh, they'll he either hear things super loud or super quiet. Time will either expand or slow down for them. Um, and, and with really high performing folks try to get to that place where it, they can expand that time where it feels like it's slowing down and they can move faster than they would normally move. I know this sounds really odd, <laughs> just even listening to myself, but it, it's something that um, I've explored an awful lot with folks uh, involved in these high stress, high pressure 
uh, shooting situations and consistently across the board, uh, there is some sort of a time distortion, uh, perception distortion, either visual or audio or uh, time sense distortions. Um, and I think you can train to that as well. I mean, we train our high performance athletes to do those kind of things. So Ron, that's, I mean, you get into an area which we'd wandered into a session ago when we started getting very much into this whole concept of time and we had a bit of fun with that, but also because I'm a time travel fanatic amongst most Brits who like Doctor Who. Uh, but apart from that, um, that time dilation is interesting because I stupidly in my time have had some ridiculous road, road crashes and things. And you, you get that sort of everything seems to go in slow-mo in that time of sudden crisis. Now, you know that time's relative if Einstein is to be believed. So we're not actually slowing down time and living life at a slower rate. But obviously our thinking, the way our brain is processing, is accelerating way beyond its normal capability or capacity. Oh, it's yeah, I'm, I'm going to bet you all respond to this in a minute. And then I've put up on screen, I'm sharing up for the video, the, the uh, diffraction patterns that Ben had taught, uh, designed. I'm hoping I'm on the right slide, Ben, because I think this really comes into understanding the OODA loop in a lot different way, not just these entry and exit and open system and implicit sort of guidance and control, but this whole time dilation aspect is a critical thing. And if we want to drive high performing teams, and certainly in the world of yours, Ron and Lou, high performing teaming, and, and actually in the ex-military worlds of both Ponch and Ben, it's critical to be able to use that within that time construct as well, because it's those split seconds or microsecond decisions that save lives or, or, or change an outcome in, in some way. We want it in business because we want better, faster, quicker, more effective companies and organizations so we can leverage what's learned in the really dangerous world to bring into the business world, which is only dangerous because of narcissists, and, and sort of, and sorry, and fix that sort of problem. So anyway, I want to throw that back. This is my mad sort of layman's oh, sort of thought. Roger. To add on to that and to what Ron said, so I was a medic in the army. We have what we call the golden hour. We don't know when that golden hour is going to hit, but it's going to hit at any time. And so we train to that golden hour. And so say, for example, you have um, an ID hit your Humvee and you're the medic on that Humvee. Your instant reaction is to check where your crew is at and make sure you're going to stop bleeding. That's what we train for. Stop bleeding at any cost possible. First, of course, take cover. Make sure you're not taking fire. Make sure your, your observations of your security is fine. But these all become secondhand nature, what we call that muscle memory. And you just begin to do these things. But these come out of, I, I, I call it fear institutions of knowledge, because you don't understand these things until you've been in the situation that you don't know how to react to. So this is why we try and create these high fear situations for these medics, where we shoot at them with blanks while they're trying to drop an IV with no light in the middle of no lord knows where so we create these obscene scenarios so they can perform and can execute in the actual environment so they don't actually think they just act and that's what that true implicit guidance muscle memory control is in those situations and so that's kind of like the bread and butter of how we train our soldiers and our medics that, that that's interesting because i'm reading what Chris has just put in the chat, which reminds me of a conversation in the last session and was what part of the inspiration for the video I made for this conference about, you know, these, these sort of PDCA loops, because we, we get, we teach people things like kata, not just in martial arts, but you know, now in business with Toyota kata as a temporary scaffold to teach some repeatable behavior and PDCA is taught this way in organizations. There's lots of other examples of that. But then these are drilled and ritualized approaches that, you know, that we have. You've got the military version of drilling. You've got the business version, which is kata and PDCA. And you've got the martial arts version, of course, which is kata. But we've talked in a previous session that that's all well and good. 
But when the big guy, bad guy jumps up with this, you know, a three foot blade and starts waving it at you and you're poncing around doing your kata, that ain't going to be much use to you. And I'm sure the officers have got much more experience of this, that, you know, the bad guys don't come at you in a planned sequence. You can train in multiple scenarios and multiple use cases to try and cover your bases. But there's always going to be a time when that isn't going to be sufficient. You need to be able to respond to the the, the scary clown jumping out of the jack in the box there. And, and I do want to at some point bring that back as well to what Andrew's saying about mapping these to organizational goals, because I think part of the value of these conversations is how do we bring that? How do we bring this sort of from the, the, the world that you guys are all talking about and actually apply it with some practical, with some ability in, in business and organizations? Uh, I don't think there's any comments on the sort of, what Roger just said in the sort of drilling and the ritualization. Um, and then we maybe talk to, uh, to Andrew's points about bringing this into the praxis of business. Yeah, I, I, I've got something that's um, been bugging me a little bit. So, Lou, if you hold up your slinky on the pipe again. He's got a different slinky. It's a little yeah. slinky. Now, Imagine that the pipe was actually a slinky, right? So the, okay. <laughs> We're going meta slinky, slinky yes, not slinky, exactly. little old slinky. Here we go. That's a, that's a big slinky, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> There's a comment, but I'm not going to make it. Okay, so, so now if you stretched out the big one and you have the small one, wrapping around the loops of the big one, right? Mm. So let's say the big one's a team and the small one, or their multiple mm. small ones are the individuals. Yeah. So, Very good. so yeah. now we're talking about the intuition that, you know, the green slinky is the junior guy and you've got another slinky that's the senior guy and they're observing Lou. Right, so now you've got your team that's working through this, the shoot house. You've got the individual OODA loops. Now, your senior guy, the, the coils of the green one are gonna be a lot closer together, right? The, the fidelity with which, within which he can sense and respond to the environment and how he can attune to lose body language and all, of the, all the little bits. Um, so those, those, his loops are gonna be closer together. Junior guy's gonna be spread out but they're all going to be wrapping around the same team slinky, which is going through time. And, that's, and this is how we, I think, bring this back to organizations and to, you know, and, and actually there's, there's probably within, within each person's individual slinky, there are their skills and drills and training, which are their small slinkies wrapping around the, the, the spirals of their personal slinky, if you get if you understand, and then to, to Roger's point about training, right? There's absolutely no point building your slinky in in the environment that it's not going to be deployed in, right? You learn you learn the small building blocks like weapon handling. Like I remember that from the military. The first time you teach somebody to handle a weapon, you definitely do not put them in a kill house and put them under stress, right? You you teach them small building blocks that they will then take and compress into their biggest slinky of Okay, now I'm on a range and I've got live rounds. And then you take the skills that you've learned there of marksmanship and, and weapon safety and muzzle handling, and then you put them into live firing. And then if they, you know, if they haven't killed themselves or anybody else, then then you put them into the shoot house. And then you still got this kind of, and this is all vertical compression. Right. And then you've still got levels of experience of people that have seen it in the wild uh, versus people that haven't, and people that can kind of get that sensory um compression and, and build the intuition from it my Sorry, can, I just, just, can i just add yeah, to that just... quickly ben, ben ben showed a really interesting visual and i think this is related ben isn't it of the <clears throat> um the solar system where you've got everything orbiting around each other in much bigger increments or much smaller increments depending on what it is and it was a superb visual so do we have that visual on the canvas it's no, it's, a, it's an animation. Nigel, yeah. I'll find it and um, 
it's it's a it's a video of it's, it's essentially a planet moving no it's it's a sun moving through the uh, galaxy i guess <laughs> the next biggest incre increment to uh, the solar system with the planets traveling around the sun with the uh, moons traveling around the planets and it's just this kind of overlapping spiral you know it's it's basically what i was thinking when i when i said that thing on my arm in the last video yeah so i'm just gonna comment because oh blaney here he said uh can you hold up your slinky on the pipe again is a phrase i never thought i'd ever hear so i, <laughs> I wanted to share that with the audience uh, i'm sure that's look, not true <laughs> but well no, of, i never want to hear it again now either jesus <laughs> <laughs> so um but look because we're getting close to the end of our time, at least on this session, and and I want to get that animation from you, Ben, so I, can, I will put it into the video. I'll edit, edit it in at the appropriate time. But, Andrew, you were you were talking quite a bit about mapping this to organisations. You made a bunch of notes there. There was a bit of chatter between you and Lou, uh, and then there were some words about fractal and recursive OODA loops and, uh, uh, and other things. So I just want to bring you in and see whether or not we can bring in some business perspective to this, because you're always the guy who level puts us in a level heading headed place. Yeah. And brings us out of this eclectic world. We've just spent the last hour in. Yeah, I'll do my best. I am struggling to keep up this morning. It's been an amazing conversation. So I think, um, I'm going to refer to Esther Derby's, uh, scene model. Um, and Esther talks about kind of three, uh, three aspects of, of, of how you look at organizations. So the first one we'll talk about is the making layer, which is the, I suppose, the team layer where we do the stuff. And some of the stuff that we do is quite repeatable. Some of it is quite deep knowledge work, but we can probably break that into making under normal circumstances and making under pressure. So I think there, that for the things that we understand all the things that are knowable in organizations what our aim is to do is to develop that unconscious competence that people have been talking about or that in implicit uh, knowledge so that we're really good at the things that we know we need to do but conversely we also need to be able to develop the ability for people to handle those high pressure situations and they're probably not going to be life and death like uh, some of the things that people have been talking about on this call but there will be spikes in demand. There will be outages. There will be uh, things that put people under pressure and, and maybe make it more difficult than normal to complete the things that they need to do at that make level. Um, it also appears that one of the things that organisations aren't doing particularly well, which uh, high pressure organisations do well, and I think you speak about this in the book, The Flow System, Nigel, um, is uh, developing the ability so that different people with different perspectives can come together rapidly as teams to bring to bear expertise on a problem. So that sounds like something that high pressure organizations do that uh, you, your average organization could really learn from. And the other thing that we're, we're looking at at the making level is how do we how do we build competency? So Kim was talking earlier about subjectivity and complexity um, and, and also about the fact that humans can take novelty into operations. So we can make the com complex clear over time by learning. So organizations also have to be quite effective at the making level at bringing complexity into operations or bringing novelty or new ideas and making them uh, developing that unconscious comp com competence. So that's kind of the making level, but then you start to move up. So if I'm, I'm looking at the slinky and the slinky, and, and then I'm thinking there's a slinky around that. So this is the enabling or enhancing triple uh, slinky. layer in the organization. Yeah, this is triple so far. Um, so at the enabling enhancing level, I am developing the systems and enhancing the systems in which people work. So I am I'm bringing uh, capital, I'm, I'm basically working out how we're going to deploy, deploy capital, working out how we're going to bring people together and working out how to optimize the flow of work through the system. Um, and, and that's kind of that middle management role is um, how do I create the systems to make the teams effective? Now, as soon as you start talking about that, the feedback cycles are longer than the, than the feedback cycles in making. Um, but also there's 
things are less knowable. So if I think about what people talk about in terms of measurement, like um, uh, go to Deming, which says what Deming says about putting numbers around things, you can try and put numbers around things at that level, but often you are not, the things that you're measuring are going to drive behaviours that are that, that you don't want because pure numbers are never going to tell you how effective the system is. So what you're really trying to do is just get, draw inference and make sensible interventions that don't disrupt things. And then there's another layer above that, which is the steering layer in the organisation, which is kind of setting direction um, and um, working out strategy, working out the capital investments that you're going to make. So acquisitions, uh, mergers, uh, large capital purchases. Now, this is a really long feedback cycle and it's very unknowable. And there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening in the external environment. So it's not just trying to work out how the Koreans think in order to, uh, to, to go into battle with the Korean Air Force. There's all these different players in that space. And it also almost starts to become unknowable at that level. So it's kind of longer feedback cycles, less knowable, but you're still kind of going through that same loop. Anyway, that's, that's kind of where my brain went. So I'm just following the chat because I think context is a huge thing here because uh, Lou was saying, you know, uh, quite well, Chris, or maybe it was Chris as well, that we were talking about Uda turtles. I'll come back to the turtles in a minute. Um, but, you know, if you Lou was saying, if you're facing an opponent, it's too late to develop unconscious competence. And I like the competency model, which goes from, you know, unconsciously incompetent, which is basically bliss, because you don't know how stupid you are and you don't really care either. And then you become consciously competent, which is Dunning-Kruger, which is where you think you're an expert now because you're now consciously aware of your incompetence. And then, of course, you work your way around to when you become unconsciously competent which is this state of sort of you know re when you follow the shuha re route or so, something but of course if you're in this sort of you know life or death or sudden critical it may not be life or death it could be a critical business decision and you got to make it and you haven't got time for that that sort of long look and that that sort of retrospective sort of uh, viewpoint then you've got to make things really, really rapidly. And as Ben went on to say, fast transients are when you choose or recognize the need for moving between those fractal levels of OODA loop. And this is some of the, so I think that the way we make decisions, what I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm discerning from this is the way we make decisions and the way the OODA loop plays out depends heavily upon the context, the time horizon, the stress levels, Am I, am I joining the dots here, Chris? You're smiling at me, so I'm looking for encouragement here. I'm, I'm mostly um, I'm mostly laughing at Ponch's comments, but yes, I, I so agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of these aren't broadcastable, thankfully. I won't be sharing the text files uh, with them. I mean, there is the element of luck as well. I mean, and this is one thing I'm seeing in quite a few of the comments you're making here, is that, you know, luck does, is a part of complexity. We're not just clever. You know, sometimes we get lucky. We play the lottery, we win, you know, and, and, uh, and the, you know, it's, I agree with some of the comments. I won't call out who's saying them about all these 100% success case studies on LinkedIn. You know, luck was never part of it. We were experts by our system. Uh, and <laughs> and so I won't, won't uh, to make any final comments on that. Um, all right, listen, time is time is upon us because we all have days to go to and, and do things, especially in the folks waking up in Australia, they have to go and earn a living. Um, last thoughts from everybody, and uh, we'll definitely set up a fourth session. Kim, I'm going to come to you. You've been quiet for the last 10 minutes while we've all been rambling about turtles and fractals and fractal turtles or something like that. So what do you think, Kim? I'm really happy that Lou brought the slinkies because that visual got me thinking that's why it's hard for teams to spin up um, by the time you have all of those slinkies together at the start they're going to tangle right uh, until they kind of sort themselves out and someone put the term harmonization of the slinkies I think that's an awesome term so yeah really cool no I think it's a great it's comment a and album. definitely sorry go ahead I just said I didn't like their second album if you listen to a lot of prog rock they all seem to be called something along those lines so <laughs> yeah but as somebody said to me the other day chris if you remember the 70s you weren't there so 
<laughs> uh, Ponce, you got any final thoughts? Yeah, hey, I just want to thank uh, Ron and Lou and our first responders that are out there. I know that they're facing uh, nasty OODA loops that are that are uh, emerging uh, in this new environment. But thanks for being on. And uh, Margot took off already. She had to make dinner. But it's awesome having you. And, and last thing, the, the flow system, and I hate to make a plug for it, we didn't write it for agile organizations or for agile companies. It's, it's, it's useful everywhere. And that's why we really put uh, a lot of effort in the complexity. And John put a lot of effort in the uh, team side leadership side, and then, of course, Kanev and, and uh, the OODA loops in there for uh, a reason. But thanks for being here, Lou. Uh, thanks for being here, Ron. Good seeing you guys. And, uh, you know, you guys be safe. You guys uh, keep your heads up. Uh, we're behind you, man. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to recognize not just Lou and Ron because they're out there fighting the good fight day to day in really dangerous situations. But both Roger spent 20 years in the military. Ben was a, a Marine. Was it a Green Beret, Ben? I don't know. I'm, I'm being a yeah, I'm, it's so really, really sort of a decorated set of, uh, of soldiers in the UK. And of course, Ben, uh, sorry, Brian he, Ponce, he just flew planes or something off a, off a boat, apparently. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, anybody else, Ron, Lou, any final thoughts before we, we stop the recording for this session? I think uh, this is a fabulous discussion and uh, very honored to, to be part of it. And I'm certainly going to continue following and and uh, poking at this, it's uh, this is just a, a, a cool, uh, cool idea and uh, a lot of fun. I think it'll help a lot of people kind of figure their stuff out. So really, really honest. That's really kind comments. Uh, Lou, anything from you? And then I'll just ask Ben and Roger. Yeah, thank you again for having me. If, uh, if this is gonna go anywhere, I'd like it to include how Kinevin can be used to exploit what we know about how UDA works to get faster UDAs. Yeah. And I know that's a mouthful, but uh, I spent a lot of time in, uh, in our training unit, everything from report writing to SWAT operations to very technical things like uh, weapons manipulations. And they all operate in different domains of Kinevin. And if we can maximize, right, and uh, efficiency is not maybe the best word, but I'm going to use it. If we could be as efficient as possible into learning and getting good at things, right? In the by acknowledging the domain that that thing sits in, right? We can take your capacity to operate from here to here. Right. And I think that I think that is like the big strategy of life. Right. Is by being able to accept more by being able to figure change out more. And if we're more purposeful with learning, education, training by using the Kinevin. Then we can crush Uda. So th thanks so much for including me, Nigel. No, absolutely. And you're all invited back, of course. And let me just tell you, I mean, I was reading the chat and I was watching Chris and Kim's heads were like those dogs you have in the back of a, a car with a slinky neck, you know, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that was definitely happening. I, I can see the comments in there about the nodding frenzy. Uh, Dave is watching these videos, just so you know, Dave Snowden, and he, he will at some point participate uh, with others, maybe, and to debrief a lot of this. But Lou, what you just said, I'm going to replay that. And I'm going to make that as the, the sort of topic for the next session, because I think that's where we start to really think we start to be able to improve what we wrote in the book, but also start to really bring out how we can actually apply this, not only in, you know, emergency services, first responders in the military, but also in business and in daily life. I think there's a lot of praxis there we can drag out. And I think if we do that, then apart from these exploratories being a lot of fun and a lot and a lot of, you know, uh, brain brain warping going on, I think actually uh, this could become very, very valuable. Uh, and Lou was saying, you know, what Andrew was getting at, that, you know, there's there's uh, you know, that's that's where this can actually drive. And I think that's really useful. Roger, I'm just going to let you have the last word since you're our scientist and and. Uh, and, and really clever person. <laughs> so what do you got? What's your thoughts? Thank you so much for letting me be part of this uh, part of this group. I've learned a lot and also expounded a lot of um, uh, just kind of knowledge all around. 
very grateful to be around such smart people. Thank you. Yeah, you and me both. So just to, 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 to mention at the last, at the end of this, the, the stuff that uh, sort of Andrew had said is, you know, mapping to organizational goals, do the noble things well, develop unconscious competence in the things that we know we need to do. Uh, number two, develop the ability to handle high pressure situations, which of course Lou and Ron were talking about extensively. Uh, three, enable rapid teaming so that when different people come together, they can work effectively, which Andrew had said he'd, he'd been reading the book. And I give a lot of credit to Professor John Turner on that for his expertise in team science. And then of course, of course number four, develop competency in bringing novelty. So things we didn't think of, crazy ideas, whatever. That's where a lot of your implicit stuff comes in, into complexity and bringing that into operations, which is in the clear domain. So these are some great things we'll explore in the next session. I My head explodes every time we have these conversations. I really do struggle to keep track. I'm not as clever as any of the other people on this screen. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to session four. I'm just going to stop the recording. Uh, bear with me one second.